Okay, um, Alistair down below here, am I, well, he's down below on my screen, MI Zero Romeo Whiskey Yankee um, uh, is our speaker for today. Um, I'm not going to do any uh, introducing, I'll let him uh, introduce himself. I can tell us a wee bit about uh, himself and everything else. You may recognise his voice before you, uh, when, once you hear him speaking. He is also one of the GB2RS newsreaders on the DMR. Um, so it's good to put a, a face to the picture as well, Alistair. And um, a, a face to the voice, sorry, I mean. And uh, good to have you with us. So, Alistair, in your own time, uh, over to you there. Okay. Um, right. I have a few slides prepared for this afternoon, but I'm prepared to go anywhere anybody wants to go. We can stop, we can go ahead, or whatever you want to do. I'll try and ask, answer all the questions. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer every single one, but uh, I'll have a good go at it anyway. Um, as you can see, we're human. Um, we live in dark rooms. We live in the control towers. Um, we, we get paid to look out a window. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, look out a window, you can see the season's changing. And um, you, you look out a window quite a lot. I've been doing the air traffic job um, after speaking to Dave the other night, just made me realize that it's 40 years next month since I became qualified. I actually started working Short Brothers as an aircraft electrician in 1975. And I worked my way through my apprenticeship and a job, a part of the job was um, doing the maintenance and air traffic control. And I was doing the radar and radio maintenance and um, a job came up for a trainee controller and by some luck I got it and one of my other colleagues who, who's retired now from Autogove he got it as well so um, that's how I got into it uh, there are other ways of getting into it um, you can go direct entry or you can get a company to sponsor you um, if they're prepared to do that or you could start I know people are were baggage handlers are now air traffic controllers I know guys who are postmen are now air traffic controllers so you don't have to be uh, super intelligent to do the job. You have to be quick thinking and you have to be able to think on the way out. So you've got plan A, you've got to have plan B up your sleeve if plan A doesn't work. If plan B doesn't work, you've got to move to plan C. So you're always, you're always forward planning. So um, as I say, I have a few slides prepared. So hopefully I have not used Zoom before. So this is a new one for me. Um, I had a little rundown with Dave the other night. I'm not the best at it. I can use, I'm good with technology, except not too bad with technology, as you'd say. Although um, I find some radar systems are easier to use than the washing machine, but uh, there you go. You always have to ask the wife how to use the washing machine, you know. But here we go. Well, I'm going to try and work through it. Anybody wants to say anything, stop me. Change the subject or anything like that, and uh, we'll work our way through it. It's uh, 25 to 4 now, so hopefully we'll, we'll, um, we'll not be too long. If you think it's too long, Dave, just uh, let me know and uh, we'll go somewhere else. So hopefully this will work. Right, I was going to share a screen with you and you got it now? Okay, Dave? Yep, 100%. Yeah, okay, well, this is a runway at City of Derry Airport. Um, I got to tell you about the runway in that some of you may already know, but um, maybe others don't. This is runway 26 at City of Derry Airport, which I work there now. I was at Belfast City for 30 odd years and now I'm up, um, now I'm up at uh, City Dairy Airport. So this is runway 26, looking out towards Sheriff's Mountain, out towards the southwest. The runways are designated 26 and 08 at uh, Eglinton. That's the magnetic heading of the runway and that's how the runways are designated. The opposite direction is runway 08, so if you were going off runway 08, you're going off uh, towards the northeast, which will take you out towards Scotland, etc. If you're heading off 26, you're heading out to the west. So your next stop after Ireland is the coast of the United States. The runway is 1,969 metres long and it's uh, 45 standard metres wide. There are smaller uh, runways, Belfast City's 1,829 metres. And Autogove is 2,777 metres, so it's quite a long runway there. They actually have four runways. At City of Derry Airport, it's one big strip of concrete, or one big strip of tarmac, but it's actually two, what's called two runways. You can land runway 26, or you can land from the city on runway 08. Um, the runway is grooved. It's a very rough surface. 
uh, you may look it's quite smooth, but the runway is grooved about every centimetre and the grooves run at 90 degrees to the centre line. This is to increase the, co -friction, the coefficient of friction and slows the aircraft down. If you were to use your car normally on that runway, you'd get about 2,000, possibly 3,000 miles out of a set of tyres. So uh, it, it, uh, when, you, when you hit it, you actually do stick to it quite well. Also with the um, grooves on the runway, it actually, uh, it actually drains the water quite quickly as well. So we're sitting at the end of runway 26, and uh, we're up at Loch Foyle in actual fact, so behind us is Loch Foyle. So there you can see the piano keys, which indicates the beginning of the runway. You can make out the centre line there. We're, sli we're sitting slightly to the right. Uh, you can make out the centre line and you can make out so other white boxes there about halfway along. There's aiming points and fixed distance markings along the runway. So every marking on the runway means something. The little white bar down the bottom is uh, something that needs to be repaired and has been, uh, has been marked out. Uh, we find that with the 737s in particular, if they turn very quick, they turn very sharp. The main bogies on the tyres, on the rear undercarriage, um, or, yeah, on the back undercarriage and the rear undercarriage, tends to stop and that tends to chew the tarmac up. So what we usually do is let them run right to the end. There's a big turning circle right at the end and it's a nice gentle turn and they come back up the runway again and no damage to the runway. If we have two or three aircraft coming in at a time, well, you have to think about that. You know, are you going to let them run to the end or are you not? So here we go. Now this was meant to change and um, I haven't got it to change, so we'll see what happens. There we go. Definition of an air traffic controller. Someone who solves a problem you didn't know you had in a way you don't understand. I must admit that's an official, unofficial <laughs> definition of an air traffic controller. See also wizard magician, but you know, sometimes it works out like that. So this is what I do. And this is the objectives of air traffic services. It used to be the objective, objectives of air traffic control, but European legislation has changed a lot of stuff. Believe me, the paperwork has been incredible. And the amount of stuff that we've had to learn to change over to the European way of doing things. And now they're talking about taking us out of it again in December. So we don't really know what's going to happen. So the main objectives of air traffic are to prevent collisions between aircraft, which is obvious. Prevent collisions between aircraft on the manoeuvring area, which is your runway and your taxiways. It's not your apron. It's your runways and your taxiways and obstructions on that area. Expedite and maintain an orderly flow of air traffic, which is sometimes very difficult, but um, it does work. Provide advice and information useful for safe and con efficient conduct of flights. That stands to reason. And notify organisations of aircraft in uh, need of search and rescue aid and assist such organizations as required. So that's basically the objective of an air traffic, of an air traffic control unit or an air traffic controller. That is uh, what he is expected to do. Uh, just a, a little bit there, the apron where the aircraft park get refueled and all. Air traffic control does not control vehicles entering an apron. That is up to the apron supervisor. However, in order to do the job, uh, the pilot will cooperate and he will listen to your instructions. In fact, 99.9% .9 of the times the pilots will take your instructions unless he has a reason not to. So there we go. So that's that's the main thing that uh, we have to do. Right, we've got voice communications. How do we communicate with aircraft? Right, obviously it's voice. And uh, our tradition, as it says, traditionally accomplished using radio, broadcasting and receiving on UHF, BHF, HF, and alternatively, SATCOM. Now, I have not used SATCOM, so I can't really comment too much on that. UHF is used mainly for the military type aircraft, uh, although they do have VHF as well, but uh, very, very seldom we would have uh, to speak to an aircraft on UHF. And in actual fact, I don't think we haven't even got a UHF transmitter, so um, the aircraft would swap over to VHF. Um, HF uh, is used for long range, as you're probably aware, off the coast, uh, off the coast of uh, Ireland be allocated a HF frequency and we all know the, the pros and cons of using HF. Just moving on, data communications is a big thing coming in now. It's a thing that I have not experienced but there it is. You can have your uh, communications addressing and reporting system, your ICARS, 
your CPDLC, which is your controller pilot uh, data link communication, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, ads B, we all know what that is. We've all got a, well, most of us are a receiver at home. You've got mode S, which is a different type of uh, transponder code, and you've got your transponder underneath. Transponder, a little bit of separate equipment on the aircraft, uh, which uh, transmits on uh, UHF, and uh, we'll see that very shortly. Okay, if all else fails, yeah, you can use your light signals. Um, we've just recently gone over to an LED unit and it's extremely powerful. Um, it's a battery backup system that we have. If all else fails and uh, you have an aircraft coming in who's not talking to you, you've obviously got to think, is there something wrong? He's not talking. Uh, you can use your light signals. Um, there are flares, but we don't use them anymore. We used to use them at Belfast City for the University Air Squadron, but um, flares and uh, air traffic controllers are not good news. Uh, there was an incident one time at, uh, at an airport and um, there was quite stringent regulations put on us after it. You can see the different colours of lights, the flashing lights, the steady lights, the continuous green light, which is a good one, which means to an aircraft in flight, you may land. To an aircraft or vehicle on the aerodrome, it says you may take off. And then it says underneath, not applicable to a vehicle. And I dare say somebody has tried some time or another, you know, and that's why they've had to put this in. So there you go. So all the lights have a meaning. If you were to flash a light at a pilot, a commercial pilot, um, I'm not going to say what airline or anything, but if you were to flash a light, it would be very few of them that would uh, understand it. But anyway, a green light, if he sees a green light, he'll probably, do, he'll probably know what he wants to do. Okay. Um, this, I put these couple of screens up here because somebody commented on me reading the news as being monotone, Dave. <coughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> so I have found, I've only been licensed, fully licensed for amateur radio for three years. Um, it was three years ago, Christmas Eve, where I got my uh, the, the full license. Um, I know I have been involved in it, and I was in Bangor Amateur Radio Club way back in the mid seventies as a as a, a guy at school. Um, I was in Bangor Amateur Radio Club for a little time. Oh, it was about three or four years, and then I left. And well, more interesting things came about then, and uh, I never went back to it. Although I still had an interest in it, I ever joined the air traffic world, and we had to learn the pronunciation of all the words. I have been doing it so long using radios for so long that I find it extremely difficult to get away from this. I find it extremely difficult um, to use any other words apart from what I have been trained and what I have had used over the past X number of years. Very, very difficult. I find it very difficult to even spell a word when I'm on the radio. So this is the pronunciation that they insist that we use and how it's uh, it has to be used. It's all published and they, we have two massive books and uh, everything, every procedure is all published. So you can see this. So when you hear me reading the news in DMR, I will be sticking to this. I cannot move away from it. Um, I can also tell you that I find it extremely difficult to sit down and use amateur radio because I've been doing air traffic control for so long that the messages are so quick, I expect an answer back. And I really have to think when I'm on the RT on amateur radio. So it has not been an easy transfer for me. So there you go. So that's just to finish off the alphabet, how the words are all pronounced. pronounced. I didn't put the figures up, but um, in air traffic control, there, there seems to be a, a problem with two and three, and it can get mixed up and it can cause quite a bit of um, concern if the pilot picks it up wrong, especially if you're climbing him to 3,000 feet or he, you're climbing to 2,000 feet and he goes up to 3,000 feet, you know, so he come close to another one. So it's actually two and we actually use the word tree as 3,000, so it's 3,000 feet. So it sounds a bit odd, but it works very well. The examiners look for good phraseology. Um, you can fail an exam by using poor physiology. So it's one of the things that you really have to learn off very, very quick. Okay, uh, that's a basic circuit. If I look at it, if I'm controlling in the control tower, this is a basic circuit. So 
um, you're learning to fly, or Joe Bloggs comes along on a Sunday afternoon with his dog and decides to go for a little flight. He hasn't been flying for a while, so he needs a little bit of practice. So this is what he does. He gets airborne off the runway here. Um, I don't know if you can see the mouse there. He gets, and he gets airborne, climbs to about 1,200 1, feet, and he does circuits. And he'll come around like that, and he'll come down, and then he'll come usually at about two miles, and he'll do a touch and go. He'll come down onto the runway, and he'll take off again. Practice. Uh, touch and goes. When he's confident enough or he feels um, happy enough or he may just stay in a circuit and do half a dozen of those and then that's him okay for another six months or he just uh, he'll go off somewhere else when he feels confident with the uh, with the aircraft. So all the positions mean something. Report downwind, aircraft reports late downwind, base leg is where you turn the corner and then final and your long finals between eight and four miles. All commercial pilots know this. This is basic stuff. All the commercial pilots will know this. And occasionally, if we bring an aircraft in for a particular runway, which is not in the wind, the pilot, if the weather is good enough, will request a visual positioning. And he will actually break off from the runway that he was going to land and position visually for another runway. One aircraft, I should say, take off and land into the wind. If they don't, an aircraft has a characteristic of a brick if it's not taken off into the wind. So all aircraft take off and land into the wind. Maximum airflow over the wings reduces the lift. There are occasions up to about 10 knots where they can take a tailwind departure. And again, it all depends on temperature, etc., and uh, engine performance. Alistair, a wee question there, if you don't mind. It's Go Dave ahead. here. How wide is that actual circuit, or is there a a set regulations on how wide that circuit must be away from the runway? No, um, but being fl after flying with a, a few people, um, they have certain visual points which they go to, uh, which they have marked out. This could be, you could see your crosswind leg after you go off the runway there. Um, your, this is the crosswind leg here. Um, it could be a mile. It could be a mile and a half. It's not that far because the guys flying these, these are called visual circuits, have to keep the airport in sight, have to keep the runway in sight, have to keep the ground in sight. So they're not going to go too far away. So usually about a mile, mile and a half. The downwind leg, usually about three miles. And they have specific points marked out. Um, on One on the base leg is the power station up in uh, Lisna Halley up in uh, Londonderry and Loch Foyne and that's where they would turn base leg. So you're about a mile out for the crosswind, a couple of miles for the downwind leg and then uh, as you turn the base leg it'll be about a mile again and you join final usually at about three, uh, usually about two to three miles. If uh, more competent uh, people could keep it a little bit tighter, the military just go around in an oval circuit and they're, they're gone before you even know it like you know you just don't have time with them you know. By the time you tell them to climb, they've gone. You know, they're back in Prestwick again. I experienced that recently with a typhoon. I tried to tell them to do something. They'd done it and they was away. So um, they just go that quick. And we're, you know, military traffic. We're just not used to military traffic, that type of fast traffic. So there you go. So that's basic your circuit. These are approach plates uh, for City of Derry Airport. Now, I should, also, I should say now that the City of Derry Airport does not have radar. Okay, so we do top downs by procedures, right? The pilot will have all these charts, and these charts will actually be programmed into the aircraft flight management system, but he has to have these charts on the aircraft. Anywhere that he goes, he's legally required to carry the charts for that airport. So if he was coming into City of Derry, say, and he couldn't land, he has to have the charts for Autogrove. He may have to have the charts for Dublin if it's a Ryanair, go back to Dublin. So the pilot is legally required to carry all these charts. So the one on the left is an approach procedure for runway 08. And you can make out lock foil there. And it goes actually into the Irish airspace. The dotted line is Irish airspace. So it's unique. We have a unique situation in that we go into the Irish airspace. So there's a lot of communication goes on between us and the, and the Irish. Now, they let us use this on a daily basis, but we have to tell Shannon and it's the area control center that we are open and that we are using part of their airspace. The one on the picture on the right is a basic procedure where the aircraft comes up. You can see just up there to the right, uh, a direct arrival procedure. It comes off a magnetic radial 
of the Belfast VOR, which is a beacon, VHF beacon on 117.2, and he comes up on a specific beacon or a, a specific uh, radial. He comes up to a, a specific point, he turns left, and he intercepts the ILS on a heading of 256, and uh, thereafter he comes down on the ILS, which we'll explain very shortly. So he has all the details here in the, in the bottom of the page. There's also, he can, you can see here, he can do direct arrivals via a 12 DME arc, DME being distance measuring equipment, which is a little bit of transmitter on the airfield, which I'll show you shortly. And it gives the aircraft its distance from touchdown and its distance from the airport. So by the use of these procedures and these, and these are the ones here, these ones here to the left are off an NDB, which is, you'll see that shortly as well. Um, so they're a little bit more complicated, but modern aircraft, have sat nav etc gnss approaches which have been which we have but are not yet published there's still a little bit of work to do on them and uh, i believe there's quite a cost involved in getting them uh, implemented and published but every airport you go to will have something like this every airport that has instrument aircraft coming in aircraft using the instruments must have procedures like this published you can see to the top left of each page these are the minimum heights that I can descend to until he's established on the procedure. The one to the left is out to 25 miles and the one to the right when he's within seven miles, I think it is now. So there you go. So the, the wording at the top, so London Derry Eglinton, gives the type of arrival. To the right hand side, direct arrivals, ILS, DMA, you have to have the NDB and it's for runway 26. The aircraft category A, B, C, D, that's according to the speed of the aircraft. The faster the aircraft, the wider the procedure. Obviously, because it's harder to turn an aircraft that's flying faster. It's like going round a roundabout. You go round a roundabout faster. You have to, you need a bit more room in the car to get round the roundabout. So hence, you can see on the left, the two different approach procedures. One's for category AB, which is your small type aircraft. And the one to the outer is your category C and D, which is your bigger 737s. Okay, so we've got a radar quickly. Radar, basic radio, basic radio stuff, blasts a big bit of energy out, splurges a big bit of energy out, maybe two, three megawatts, or kilowatts, you should say, not megawatts, kilowatts, two or three kilowatts, and you might get a uh, million watts back depending on the weather or other reflections. So there you go, puts it out in a particular direction. It knows when the splodge of energy goes out and it knows when it comes back. So by simple maths, it can work out exactly where you are. And again, just a block diagram of how the radar works. Transmitter generates a high power that's radiated by the antenna. In a sense, the antenna acts as a transducer. The couple of electromagnetic energy from the transmission line to radiation in space and vice versa. We all know what a duplexer does, permits alternate transmission and reception within the same antenna. So it's a fast acting switch. So there you go, the receiver selects an amplifies radar echo so that it can be processed by a computer and it's all computerized now and displayed on a flat panel display. All LCD displays now. Uh, there's none of the big glowing CRTs that I was used to, it's all gone now to flat panel display. The He's had the advantage and I'll, I'll maybe talk about that later on, just a little bit later on, but on a CRT, when the CRT was sparking, and this is with the radar I used at City, um, when the CRT sparkled, you know your radar was working well. And just one of those things, you know. So you have a signal processor, processes all the signals and uh, takes out the unwanted clutter. And believe me, there's a lot of clutter at times and it displays it, displays it on the screen. So that's basically, that's basically how radar works. You don't really want to be standing in front of it when it's transmitting, but um, it, uh, it, uh, it's a pretty powerful machine. Right, as I said before, right, most radars are required to detect aircraft when the cross section is low two, as low as two square meters. Um, the radar used in the Marconi S511, which has now uh, been superseded at City, could see a hot air balloon. It can see the burner on a hot air balloon. Um, it could see birds, flocks of birds coming in off Belfast Lock, and it could see shipping in Belfast Lock. It was an extremely good radar, 
and it was a high power radar. There's a, a different version of it. There's an even higher power, but the, the one we used was high power, but not extremely high power, but extremely good analog radar. Uh, it was displayed on like little magnet maggots on the CRT, and then they moved to um, flight control or something like that. Uh, flight uh, flat panel displays, color displays. Um, so that's it. So that's what the standard of a radar is meant to see two square meters. It could see if you. Um, if you played with it enough, you could get it to see the odd car on the Hollywood Hills up around Ballymus Star or up to the back of Hollywood. So radar goes out, the signal goes out, and it's reflected from land, sea, rain, snow, hail, and everything. And it all comes back. Um, we all know about sporadic E. On a good day, when there's sporadic E about, of course, everything gets ducted. And um, the radar would show the Scottish coast up in quite fine detail. You could actually make out the Scottish coast. The radar is uh, a range of 65 miles. An approach radar is a range of 65 miles. Air traffic control is only allowed to use it out to a range of 40 miles. You can actually use it out to 42 miles from the because there's a, a bit of airspace around the uh, aerodrome called an aerodrome traffic zone. So you can take it out to 42 miles. In an emergency, that goes out, that goes out the window. As long as nothing goes wrong and you don't do anything silly, um, you can use it out to whatever range you want in an emergency. But generally, they're used to 40 miles. All the procedures are adopted so that um, the machine is used to 40 miles. So you get clutter from everything, and we'll come to that very shortly. Atmospheric effects, yes, rain, hail, thunderstorms, they all affect your radar performance. The advantage with the older type radars, uh, and particularly the McCauley S511, was you had a control panel above your head, and you could tweak it. You could tweak it a little bit, and if you pushed the button, there was a little bit of material. I'm not too sure what it was. It could have been a bit of mica or something that went into the waveguide. So it came up into the waveguide like that, and instead of being horizontal polarization. Or vertical polarization, vertical polarization, I should say, it became circular polarization. And circular polarization reflected off the, the weather less than the vertical polarization, and it had a different effect. It also had an effect of reducing your aircraft size. Um, so you had different ways of um, limiting the amount of clutter that you got on the, on the screen. If you set it up very well, you could see the thunderstorms. Um, Modern type aircraft now and modern radars don't really show that anymore, but they and the aircraft will say to you, request a turn 10 degrees, 20 degrees to the right or to the left due to weather. You can hear that sometimes on if you listen on the various aviation frequencies. And then you probably hear the controller saying, Roger, that's approved. With the S511, if you had a lot of traffic, with the S511, you could actually make thunderstorms glow on the screen and you could actually provide the weather information, you could actually steer the aircraft around the weather. And um, it wouldn't be the first time that I've seen crews coming up and wanting to see how it was actually done. The advantage of that was you don't let the airplanes go off and do what they want. You know, you, you just don't want them to do that. You know, pilots go on and do stupid things, you know. So you retain control of the whole lot. So that, that was an advantage of that. You could retain control of the whole lot. So there you go. So that's it. Um, that's radar. And you can see the bit at the bottom, the decrease in density of there's atmosphere with increasing altitude causes waves to bend as they propagate through the atmosphere. Right, interference. Uh, just very, 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 very briefly. You can get I ask Alistair a quick question? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, just you're talking about radar and the cross section area of two square meters. And then we've got all these stealthy bombers and stuff. How would they react to your radar? Would you see it at all? Probably wouldn't see them. No, they yeah. probably wouldn't see them because they're designed not to reflect, not oh, to right. reflect stuff. Um, yeah, you, po you probably would not see them. Now, I have not been in that position, but it's more than likely you won't see them. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you get interference from different things. Um, uh, there had to be a modification done to a radar recently, um, whereby uh, the mobile, they put a mobile phone mast up fairly close to it, 
and we had to put well, there had to be various filters put into the receiver on the uh, on the radar to stop the interference. You do get electric uh, electronic countermeasures if you've got a big military exercise on. Um, you can see some stuff. We don't know what it is. You can see stuff. Uh, you can get noise jamming. I have seen that jamming of the uh, the receiver when there's a big exercise going on. Um, and so you've got all this put together, which sort of um, you've got to look out for. Uh, if um, you have a big military exercise on, as I say, um, you will get uh, you will get electronic countermeasures. Um, the problem is, and at the very bottom, a humble metal foil balloon will cause interference. There are procedures uh, for people releasing balloons close to an airport. Um, a little rubber ones don't cause too much hassle. If it gets into an engine, it'll just go out the back. If there's a whole lot of them, well, it can be a little bit more serious. But generally, a, a balloon will just go through um, an aircraft engine. Um, we there are we have known of ducks going, uh, birds going through engines, and they go out the back. They get chewed up a wee bit. And you always know if it's gone through the engine because when the aircraft lands, the uh, ground crew say you get, you want to smell the chicken down here, like you know it's burning, you know so. When you see bits of it sticking out the back of the airplane, but the, the humble metal foil balloon can cause interference. Okay, now this is an old radar, and I learnt on this radar at an airport which is near the main capital of Northern Ireland, not in County Antrim. Uh, well, it is in County Antrim, but the one off the Sydney bypass, and this is a Plessy 424. And um, as a as an apprentice, I used to maintain well, try and maintain this thing. It's a range of twenty five miles. It's a single single user operator. The screen on the right goes out to twenty five miles. The screen on the left is five miles. It is extremely accurate. It can talk aircraft down to half a mile from touchdown. It is extremely accurate. As you can see, it's three centimeters, ten gigs. Yeah, uh, just got a rain shower and it just wiped the whole lot out. You just could not see anything. The reflection, the clutter on it. This one could actually see the streetlights in the Sydney bypass. Um, this was the approach facility at Belfast City um, until 1987. There was no ILS at Belfast City. We had two our radar guys, the radar guys there. We could. Um, use one guy would use one screen and the other guy would use the other screen the other screen to the left is a five mile range it's five miles you go on to permanent top down from there so five miles from touchdown your height should be one five zero zero feet four miles from touchdown you go on to permanent transmit and then you get landing clearance from the control tower there's a little landing indicator about somewhere and i haven't been able to see it but there is a little landing indicator and he pushes a button to request a landing clearance and the guy upstairs will say Oh, give them a white light, continue approach. So you haven't got landing clearance. And um, so you come to two miles, you still haven't got landing clearance. And um, if the tar man was feeling particularly nasty that day, he would hold on to the land, landing clearance to the very last minute. But um, hopefully you would get a green light and you clear the aircraft to land because you're on permanent transmit. And uh, you can't, well, you can't actually hear the aircraft transmitting, you can hear it breaking. And that's one of the reasons why air traffic control still uses AM. Um, if you get a red light, well, you have to overshoot. This thing here running 400 hertz, I am not exactly sure of the voltage. There was a huge inverter down the stairs of a big motor that uh, ran 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, you wrote with a China graph on the screens, you can see there, big CRTs. And when you'd finished with the airplane, you had a damp cloth and you wiped it off. And you went on to the next one. It was meant to be one aircraft at a time, but the guys at uh, City actually developed it and developed a situation or a, a sort of procedure where they could have uh, two guys sitting beside it. The problem was that the aerial, you could tilt the aerial up and down, so you could make the aerial go high, the aerial go low, you could tilt the aerial. And um, when the guy was using the radar out of 25 miles, and the guy was doing a talk down, he would want the aerial down lower, so the guy in the 25 miles would lose, would lose his, his radar blip. The way it went, but um, it worked as a we worked as a team and it worked out okay. The most important piece of equipment and using this radar here 
was a very powerful magnifying glass because the, the, um, the radar blips were like pinpricks. Okay, this is a modern. This is, you've gone from the old Plessy 424. Um, this is the radar room at Belfast City. This is taken a few years ago. Um, you can see the, on the left-hand picture and even on the right, you can see the flight progress strips. Um, they have been replaced by electronic ones. I have never used the electronic ones. I'm still using the paper ones. It has advantages, it has its disadvantages, but it, um, using electronic flight progress strips um, has its advantages and it can cut down telephone calls because you can move your strip and then Autogove can see what one you want to get off next. I don't know the full ins and outs of it just yet, but um, one of these days, one of these days. So it does cut down telephone calls. Um, used to be Belfast City, it took six telephone calls to get one aircraft airborne. And so it's dramatically reduced the workload. Okay, this is the famous Marconi S511, which I like in particular. So airport radars typically operate in the range of 2,700 to 2,900 megahertz. This one has a wavelength of 10 centimeters. So it's not just so susceptible to the rain. It has a range of 65 miles, as I say, we use it out to 40 miles, and it rotates at 14, uh, 15 RPM. The 424, the old radar, because it was needed refreshed all the time, operated at uh, 25 RPM. And believe me, it was a quite a small radar scanner. And when you stand and look at it, it doesn't look that big, or it doesn't look that fast, but I can tell you, I held on to it one day, and I got knocked off it very quick. So there you go, that was it at Belfast City. Um, that was it, it is no longer there anymore. This is the new type one that they had. You saw the displays there a, a few seconds ago. Um, it's a Celex Italian built radar. This is actually the one at South End, but Belf Belfast City is the same. Not very good serviceability on it at all. Not very good serviceability. It's a low power digital radar. Still the same range, out to 40 miles. It goes out to, 40, uh, out to 65 miles. It doesn't show weather. The weather is processed. The weather is processed out. Um, I remember we did ask for a, a weather channel and they give us a weather channel uh, to let us see the unprocessed radar, but it wasn't terribly successful. It was all blocky and digital and it just didn't seem right, you know, but um, it's what you have. This is a low power radar. Uh, most of the engineers prefer the high power radar, but you're given, uh, you're given this, is, this is what you have to, what you have to use. The, Little bit on top of the scanner is the hog trough. It used to be known as a hog trough. I'm not too sure if it's still called that or not, because it used to be curved shape, and that is your SSR transmitter and receiver, your, your secondary radar. Right, this is your secondary radar, which operates, as you can see, receives on 1030 and transmits on 1090. You're given, the aircraft are given a code, and it's called a squawk. So the uh, radar on the ground interrogates the aircraft and uh, the signal sent from the aircraft says, hey, it's me and I'm here. So this is superimposed on your primary reflective blip. It has its advantages in that um, it's VHF. So hey, hey, you're not stuck behind hills. The radar can't see behind hills. I know VHF is technically line of sight, but you usually get the signal coming through. You get fade areas on a primary radar. This gets around your, um, this gets around your fading. There's also mode S, which is an additional series of pulses uh, sent with the transmit or with the transponder, and it can give you practically anything that you want, anything you want, you know, to know about the aircraft. The big thing in the London area is uh, if he's told to climb, say, to flight level 100, 100, once he turns the control on the altimeter, the controller can monitor it, so he can actually see that the pilot has set the correct level. So there you go, and it gives much. Um, the transponder replies more powerful than a reflected radar signal, obviously, allowing for the greater range. Okay, we'll move on to ILS very quickly. The whole principle of air traffic control ILS systems approach is to get a pilot into a situation where you can see the airfield and land. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> Technically, what goes up must come down at some time or another. So this is basically a very simple ILS system. And you can see the vertical line, that's your localizer, tells you left or right of the runway center line. The blue horizontal line is your glide path. It tells you the angle to come in at. So the aircraft comes onto the localizer 
they can come on to the localizer and at anything, but we're not allowed to use it outside 25 miles. So he comes on to the localizer at say, comes on at about 15 miles. So 15 miles and it's a three degree glide path. So it's about a hundred feet per mile that he would come in at. So he comes along and he can't start descending until he gets to 10 miles, but he will descend, but he'll descend with something else. He'll descend on the procedure. <clears throat> he'll come down then or air traffic control will bring him down to a level and the, the level of the glide path is at uh, 10 miles is at 3,000 feet. <clears throat> so 10, it's uh, 300 feet per mile. So you don't want to have the aircraft at 10 miles at 3,000 feet because there's a possibility you could skip over, the, skip over the glide path and you'll miss it. So you always want to have them down below the glide path to intercept from below because it gives you a better chance. So you would normally have the aircraft down to about 2,500 feet at 10 miles from touchdown. That means he intercepts the glide path from below. Um, and that's basically it. The glide path tells him what angle to come in at. He's got the localizer, which tells him to come left or right. And he's got the distance measuring equipment, the DME, which tells him his range from touchdown. This is all displayed on the flight management system on the aircraft. Um, it's all Morse code and the aircraft can decode it automatically and display it on the flight management system. You know, um, you ask the pilot to listen to the Morse code. Some of them do know, some of them don't. You can see minima here. <clears throat> this is the pilot's minima. He's got to make his mind up. If he can't see the runway, he has to overshoot. Um, different aircraft have different minimas. Um, the likes of Ryanair say, say to their pilots, you're not allowed our, our aircraft below 400 feet at City Dairy Airport, 400, 500 feet at Belfast City in these weather conditions. And if he reaches that point, even though the minimum might be published to 250 feet, his company says, you can't come below 400 feet, 500 feet in our airplane. He reaches 400 feet or 500 feet, he has to overshoot. That's the way it works. Uh, that is, uh, you'll get that minima varying due to the experience of pilots, etc., and their time on the aircraft. Um, and that's what's uh, called the standard operating procedures that the aircraft uh, operate under. Um, all aircraft uh, are operated under procedures which are approved by the Subvention Authority and uh, approved by the operating companies. And you'll find nowadays that uh, most aircraft will go around. They will not try to go do something else. They will go around. The more experienced pilots will go around and maybe if they can see the airfield, they'll request uh, positioning and come in for a different runway or something like that. But um, it's, that seems to be coming less, less frequent now in that everybody's afraid of moving outside the, um, outside what the book says. Um, so there you go. So here we go. Um, I picked these bits here because I thought you might be interested. This is the localizer antenna at City Dairy Airport. It's an eight-element phased array. I think Belfast City have a 14, 12 or 14, I, I just can't remember offhand. Very low power output. Everybody thinks, well, it's, you know, IRS system. Uh, no, it's only a 15-watt power output. Um, and the usable range is 25 miles, as I say. It'll go out beyond 25 miles, but for the purposes of air traffic control, we're only allowed to use it to uh, 25 miles. Pilots use it outside and say, oh, we're on the center line of 32 miles. So we just ask them to report at 25 miles and then we can do what we have to do. It's the glide path antenna, which is on 334.1. It's UHF, whereas the, um, as the localizer was um, VHF. A five watt output on this one. So very low power, very, very low power. Um, usable range 10 miles, it'll go beyond 10 miles. I know at City Dairy Airport, due to the terrain effects, outside 20 miles, the signal actually goes like this. And you get the aircraft coming in, they try to, they, they try to establish on it outside 10 miles, and the autopilot doesn't like it and disconnects, you know, and then they tell us there's something wrong with it. And we say, Well, what's your range? And they say, Oh, we're, we're uh, 13 miles. So, well, you have to wait till you're 10 miles till you use it. And as soon as they come over to 10 miles, the, the signal stabilizes. LS system is checked twice a year, flight check twice a year. The inspector comes over and flight check it twice a year. 
very expensive to keep uh, operating, but you need it. Um, the antennas here, now I had a word with my colleague this morning, Mike One Alpha India Bravo used to be, Mike India One Alpha India Bravo used to live in Bally Kelly, used to be the radio technician here. And I asked him and I told him what I was going to do. And he says, well, I should be doing that, not you. And I said, okay, well, just give, give me a rundown on what the antenna's like. So um, that one there, he said, the, G, the glide path, this is known as the glide path, the angle of dangle, um, is what's known as a sideband reference. And the theory is quite complex. But yes, the reflection plane is the foreground. Okay, right, so that means then that the grass, it has to, the area in front of this antenna all has to be graded, it has to be kept level, and there has to be very good draining, drainage and all that, because it can deviate the signal. And um, if you deviate the signal, well, it's going to give erratic indications to the aircraft, which you can see is going to be, obviously, have uh, quite, uh, quite nasty consequences. So there you go. All these areas here are um, protected. They've got sensitive areas around them and they have prohibited areas, what's called critical areas, where you're not allowed to go into if there's an aircraft coming in because a vehicle will bend the signal. At City of Derry Airport, we control the trains across the end of the runway because the train will actually bend the signal coming out from the localizer and the glide path and the pilots can see it because the aircraft, if it's coming in, and we haven't closed the railway quick enough, it will deflect the needle and the autopilot will follow it. So, you know, the, the aircraft will start to turn or it should be coming straight in. The aircraft will start to turn and that's what they say. And some of them have got used to it and say, have you a train crossing? And yeah, we well, say, yeah, uh, well, we can see it, but he's far enough out. At eight miles from touchdown, all the trains stop. The other end of the runway, it's not so critical, but uh, at um, coming in over Bally Kelly direction, Eight miles. So the DME transmits on 1042 and receives a 979 megahertz, just vertical omnidirectional antenna, and uh, that's how it works. Again, 15 watt power output. All these systems are duplicated, battery backup, uh, generator backup as well. The range on these here is zeroed to the threshold. So if you're in your airplane and you have the DME set at the very end of the runway, it will read zero. So the maximum usable range is 40 miles but in theory it's used outside that. Can I ask another question? Yeah 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 feel free. Is that equipment duplicated at both ends of the runway? Yes except the DME. The okay. DME is right in the center of the runway. I was going to come to that very shortly. The, okay. DME, the DME is centered right in the middle of the runway. Okay. Uh, I'll explain that in a, wee, in a wee second or two. Okay thank you. All right you see these warning signs all over the airport critical area do not enter. It is critical that you don't. In poor visibility conditions, we have low visibility procedures. And according to the visibility, uh, when it reaches a certain level, we introduce these low visibility procedures and we restrict all vehicles and aircraft movements so that the ILS is not affected. And, uh, and when the visibility reaches and the cloud comes down even more, we will tighten them up and the vehicles are only uh, are, can, are restrained to a very, very small area. And we know exactly, well, we know exactly what's on the runway at all the time, but there's only very few vehicles are allowed on the runway uh, at any time. So that's your ILS system. This is your ILS control panel. And uh, just to answer your question there, uh, this is not a particularly good photograph. Unfortunately, I don't have a better one. This was actually taken out of the, out of the book. At the bottom right hand side, you can see very, I can see a key. You can see a key hanging down, but it's key operated. So when I'm landing runway 26, I turn the key towards 26 and all the ILS system swaps on to runway 26. So all your ILS, all your signals point out, if you can imagine, towards Bally Kelly, out down Loch Foyle. If I'm landing the other way from over the city direction, you turn the key, the system goes through by a setup procedure. Uh, it usually takes about 45 seconds and um, everything goes to alarm, the alarms go off, and then you can see everything coming back up till the lights go uh, green. They're actually meant to be green at the top. Um, it has been known for bringing an aircraft in, or 
uh, an aircraft coming in for runway 26 and the controller has forgotten to switch it over. So the signals are going out the opposite direction and um, the aircraft can't find the signals, obviously because they're going out the other direction. Not a very nice thing to do because the aircraft then has to go into the hold till it gets sorted out and then the paperwork's incredible. Um, you've got to file a report on yourself. So why did you do it, you know? Um, but I, I have known it to happen. Okay, DF indication. Um, it's a VHF direction final. That's basically it. Phased. I think it's a phased array. I'm not exactly sure. And I didn't ask. I didn't ask uh, Mike, uh, Mike one alpha the Bravo what it was. But definitely just um, different signals, different phase. And you can see it there, the stronger bit. Let's, uh, the computer generates the direction and displays it in the control tower. And uh, that's basically it. So, as I say, we don't have radar. Uh, there's no radar in City of Derry, but this here is very, very handy for letting us know where the aircraft are. Also, when the aircraft reports final, we check it and uh, we know exactly if he's on the right track coming in. NDB, 328.5 kilohertz. Um, a very, very important piece of equipment. Uh, one of the major approach aids at uh, City of Derry Airport. And a lot of the procedures are based on this one here. Um, I asked him again today what type of antenna it was. We were using a, and we had a lot of problems with the, the antenna, and it was flapping back and forward. And it was flapping back and forward quite a bit. And the little aerial tuning unit down the bottom couldn't keep up with it. So the, the system would shut down, and there's an alarm goes off in the control tower. I said, oh, not again, you know. Um, but um, we put our, our radio amateur antenna up and uh, just a big whip, but um, I didn't like it. Um, I didn't like it and it actually burnt quite a bit of it. So uh, we're back to this here um, and we brought a guy in, an expert on it, and he sorted it out for us. And touch wood, there's been no problems with it. Occasionally, occasionally we used to get to, birds would sit up here at the top on this here. And um, the aerial would try to tune, and it couldn't, and then it would set the alarm off. Then it had to send the van out, uh, the runway patrol vehicle, and uh, he would fire off a couple of shots and keep the birds away. But um, recently we haven't had uh, that problem. They've put spikes and all on top of it as well. So um, it's a 34 self, 34 foot self-supporting vertical with center loading and capacity hat. That's what I am told by the expert. That's the type of transmission and on 2A2 uh, and just gives an explanation of what it is down there. Usable range is 25 miles. It is affected by the night effect and it's got an 80, power, an 80 watt power output. They've actually reduced it to 80 watts to reduce the, uh, the alarms on it, but uh, 80 watts is quite acceptable and within the, within the limitations. Okay, uh, just change the subject. We get an aircraft coming in or going out. These are the flight progress strips that are used, all the little pieces of paper. This uh, bottom one is your outbound, uh, oh, is your inbound aircraft. They're actually yellow strips. I don't know why the book has put them a sort of brown color. They're actually yellow. So all your information goes on your outbound strip. These come through by teleprinter and they're printed automatically by computer. So they're all actually white and uh, we put them in different colored strip holders usually get them printing out two hours before an aircraft due to arrive. They're all put in by flight planning and all that sort of stuff. That links us to an aeronautical fixed telecoms network and it prints them all out. So you've got your outbound aircraft, you've got your inbound aircraft. You have your overflights, um, an aircraft saying crossing overhead the airfield, going to Bell Arena or somewhere like that, going over to Scotland, say from uh, Enniskillen, uh, you would use that and the pink strips we use for the local flights. All these little boxes have a particular uh, purpose and they will ask you on the exams, on the initial exams, what, um, what the boxes mean. The, the slide one they usually have on an oral board, you usually have three, possibly four, a supernumerary uh, examiner, and they'll slide these across and say, hey, what does this box mean, you know? Okay, uh, ATIS, uh, Arrival or Automated Terminal Information Service, you're all aware of that. Uh, maybe some of you have listened to it. Um, it's a continuous weather system that goes out. Uh, we do weather reports every 20 past the hour and 10 to the hour. So H plus 20, H plus 50. 
the, all the weather reports are, co are coded. Uh, they're put onto this uh, computer here. Um, this one here is not a terribly good example. It's actually got a KO code, EGHH, which is uh, actually Bournemouth Airport. Uh, Citadere's EGAE, Autogolf's Echo Golf Alpha Alpha, and um, Cities Echo Golf Alpha Charlie. So all airports in the world have a four letter designator. It's used as an addressee on um, the aeronautical fixed telecoms network. So it's a METAR, it's um, a, a, an aerodrome report, weather report, and you can see the observation time. Um, the wind uh, comes in automatically off the equipment, as does the pressure and the dew points. The pressures are Q and H, and I'll explain that very, very shortly, and the runway in use. The Eglinton is 119375, so if you're anywhere up around the, there, you can have a listen to it. If you want to know the weather, you're going up that way there, dial into it. There's the telephone number, 02871810442. It is published, and um, you can dial into it. It's just a normal telephone call. There's no extra charge for it. In small letters down at the bottom, I have put Belfast City, if you're interested. And I know the amateurs do listen to it because I hear it on two metres and 70 centimetres. I hear them say, oh, we just listened to the weather at Belfast City. So it goes round and reads the weather report. The weather report's no longer than 30 seconds. We can put our own voice onto it if we want to amplify certain things like birds in the vicinity or something like that. And so the pilot dials up the frequency, the 119375 from 60 miles, 70 miles, maybe further, and he can get, um, the, uh, he can get the weather. And um, it's usually there's a code attached to it um, I just can't see it offhand. It's probably there, but I can't see it, you know. And it just starts the day with Alpha, then Bravo, Charlie. And um, as you change the weather, it uh, it changes the code letter. And I'll go right through to Zulu. And if you get to around 326 met observation, I can tell you you're shattered. And then it'll start back over again. Um, so that's, he gets the weather. Before this was introduced at City Dairy Airport, and I can remember particularly before it was introduced at City. Oh, it was horrendous. You know, you're passing this weather 40 times a day, you know, and it just got, it got tedious. Belfast City's all automated now. Uh, we're not, but Belfast City's fully automated. So there you go. So this is your ATIS now. I put this big arrow, mistake, this, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure cannot be as high as 1192, but I'll be dead. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but um, the highest I've ever seen is 1047. So there you go. So you can see your winds coming in uh, off, uh, off your um, electronic equipment. RADZ, your rain and drizzle, there's different codes for the weather. We all do Met Observers courses. We are not forecasters. We just report what we see. And I'll give you the time, and this is what's broadcast. Um, and, and also on, this, on a separate screen, I'll actually give you what the thing is, what the thing is saying. And uh, they don't like you saying, at Christmas, Merry Christmas, ho, 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 they frown upon that. They do not like it at all. The regulation people don't like any sort of fun. Okay, this is all your med equipment, and I'm coming to the end of it now. You've got your windsock. Has to be lit at night time so the pilots can see it. 25 knot windsock. When it's out straight, the wind's 25 knots or greater. So you can see it's just drooping a, a bit there. So I'd estimate when there's about uh, 20 knots. Going to the right, the top little instrument is your aeron aeronautical aeron aeronoid barometer and we read the pressure off that and by applying different correction factors to that we reduce it to the pressure the atmospheric pressure to mean sea level or aerodrome level when the pilot's coming in we will give them the atmospheric pressure which reduced to mean sea level is called q and h so we sell them the q and h 1018 he will set 1018 on the altimeter and the aircraft will tell Will read the height over sea level. We give him QFE, which is adjusted to aerodrome level, and when he sets the QFE, when the aircraft lands, it'll read zero. When he lands in the QNH, which most modern aircraft do now, it'll land, uh, it'll indicate the height of the aerodrome over sea level. So you've got different pressure settings. The little one at the top I have used for a long, long time. If anybody's familiar with the Q barometer, which is a big, long barometer, I was taught how to use that, but never used one in anger, thank goodness. Um, and it has been, this little one at the top in the brown box has been replaced by this one below, which is a fully digital automatic. And there's three barometers, three sensors in the electronic one, one sensor in the manual one, 
three sensors in the in the automatic one, and it's constantly checking itself. Moving to the right, you've got your uh, anemometer, your spinning thing, and uh, your wee weather vane, which uh, tells you what direction the wind's coming from, and the little spinners. Um, I happen to have that one at home at the moment, and um, it does work quite well. Um, and underneath that is the new ultrasonic version. You will see, um, you will see on the new road, the new A6 that runs from Belfast or comes from Belfast up past Tomb, up around that way. There's a weather station there coming up to uh, the big roundabout, Castle Dawson roundabout, and there's a weather station. I think it's to the right or the left. I'm not exactly sure. Going towards Castle Dawson, and you'll see one of those sitting on top of that. Stevenson screen, that's just where you have all your instruments. So it's a standard Stevenson screen, 1.1 meters. I remember this from the exams, 1.1 meters above the ground, and it has to face north. You can see the little lid that hangs down. It has two chains. The two chains serve, us per serve a purpose, not only to stop the, the lid falling down, but it's um, to stop you going too close so that your body temperature doesn't affect the, uh, doesn't affect the instrumentation. This is what the Met Office told me when I did the Met course at the autograph. And all of this is produced and it all comes through. And this is a weather screen that I'd have in front of me. So you can see what I talked about, information foxtrot. What I said earlier on, the runway in use, the time, what the wind's doing, the coded visibility, that all the nines means the visibility is greater than 10 kilometers. There's no weather at the present time. The clouds scattered at 4,800. The temperature is six, the dew point three. The dew point is the amount, is a measurement of the amount of water in the air. It's actually the temperature at which the water condenses out of the air and it's used for engine performance. So the pilot gets all this information, he puts it into the flight management, he knows the weight of the aircraft or the girls tell him the weight of the aircraft. How many passengers he's got on board and he tells the aircraft all this and the aircraft says, okay, you need 85% thrust to get everyone from City to Airport from, um, uh, Belfast City or Oracle, and you need 80%. So the figures are pretty, have to be pretty. So you can see your QNH, which is your atmospheric pressure reduced to sea level, your QFE, which is your atmospheric pressure reduced to the aerodrome, and you have a couple of other ones, which uh, we'll not go into them because it just becomes a little bit complicated. The live bit, or the, you've got your time up there, your date, and your live bit is actually what's happening to your pressure at a specific time. Remember, this could be up to 30 minutes old, this weather. And if the QNH changes, you will, it'll flash up red here. At uh, four, time 4.5 four, and time 15, the alarm goes off and this meter thing starts to flash to tell you it's actually a fact it goes off at time 50 and time 20 and you have 10 minutes to do the weather report. And there's an alarm go off and the alarm's actually like a, one of these submarines that is going submerged and that's what it's like. You can't really miss it. Down below is TAFs, Terminal Area Forecasts, which are your forecast for EGAE, which is City of Derry, and EGAA, it's all coded. Um, EGAE reads uh, between 1800 hours and 2300 hours. The wind will be 160 at 10, the visibility greater than 10 kilometers. The clouds expected to be few at 20 hundred and broken at 4000 feet. You can get thunderstorm weather, etc. And um, that's what's presented in front of me in a very important piece of equipment. We can put our own information in here. We can, this is what the ATIS is saying. We can put birds in the vicinity. Uh, I can put whatever else I want. That's just uh, free space, whatever I want to put in it. And um, that's it. So that was, I thought, about 20 minutes. So I hope I haven't bored you. If there's any questions, please, I have rattled on and rattled on. So. Um, I hope it was of some interest to you. Absolutely, absolutely. And you're happy enough to take any questions, Alistair? Oh, yeah, yeah, as long as they're not too difficult, yeah. <laughs> are you, you going to stop the recording, Dave? I give it, well. I, I might ask the question that you might not want to answer, but it's just been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Does anyone have any questions that could be public? And then we'll maybe see what we can do after that, you know. <laughs> you talked earlier on about the duplexer for the uh, radar. Does it actually switch over constantly? Or is, or is the duplexer the filtered one out the other? Um, it, it actually operates automatically, as you can imagine. Um, I can't 
I can't remember the what they called a PRF, the pulse repetition frequency of the of the radar, but it it operates by itself. It operates remotely, um, and that's about basically all I can tell you. I I have known for one to go unserviceable. Well, radar you know tends to go unserviceable. Um, well, not that often, but I, I remember a new duplex or being fitted to it. Um, that, that's about all I can. Uh, that's about all I can really tell you about it. So hopefully that was a, a little bit. Of, uh, you know, hopefully that will answer your question. Yeah, it, it does that. But yeah, the, the other thing I was going to ask you was, how powerful is the radar? A couple of you said there, not. Uh, how what powerful is it? Um, I believe from memory, um, it's about a three to four kilowatt output. So that would do a duplex in the way. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's pretty, it's uh, pretty powerful stuff. Like um, the Marconi S five eleven, the Clystron in it. When you opened the cabin, this thing used to growl at you, you know, and glow orange, you know. And um, I didn't like hanging up. Well, I didn't like hanging about too much, you know. But uh, the radio mark said, "Oh, it's all right." Um, it was like on the Plessy four two four, and I said, "It's fairly low." It was a fairly low. Um, small radar scanner so you could really reach up and touch it um, and it was the apprentice's job to clean the slip rings but you cleaned the slip rings when it was gone and uh, a friend of mine used to work in the BBC at Sprucefield and he used to call yeah. it the teeth tingle yeah it yeah. was about 64 kilowatts <laughs> used to well, I, I think the radar was about a three three four kilowatt output I would have to check now but um, on the 424, I can't remember the power I put in it, but I used to get a cloth and spray it with, um, with a cleaning solution, anti-static solution. I used to take the cover off the slip rings, about six slip rings in there. I remember they're going right at 25 RPM. I used to stick it in and hope for the best, you know, and then the radar worked a treat again, you know, but um, you didn't spray too much anti-static fluid on, you know, because it got a wee bit wet and then things started to happen, you know, but um, I can remember doing that many times, and I never really, it was never really explained. Um, I'm not going to say how dangerous it was, but you know, it was a wee bit, it was a wee bit dodgy. But rather than shut the whole lot down and do it, you know, that's what. Have you still got all your fingers? That's what. The, <laughs> that was another. That was another thing. Like you know, it was uh, it was crazy, and um, it was about five or six drive belts in it, and um, the drive belts. I don't know what they were made of, but um, they really did. They really did irritate the skin, whatever was in them, you know. So, Alistair, um, just a wee question here for you, and I suppose this is a bit of a, a cheat leading question because we were talking about this the other night, but I thought it was a great story. Being an air traffic controller for 40 years, coming on there, have you ever had any dealings with aircraft that has really stuck out in the mind and you've, you've sort of really yeah. enjoyed, you know? As you're record, as you're recording at the moment, I'll I'll, I'll tell you a simple one. Um, there was a problem. I think it was after an air show one time. Well, we had a word about this the other night, um, and I think it was after an air show one time. And uh, everybody knows the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. Mm -hmm. well, they got, as they said, temporarily unaware of their position. In other words, <laughs> lost. Yeah, pilots never say they're lost, you know. No, they'd never admit to that, you know. Oh, that's a big no no. Um, nowadays, we try to encourage them to say, you know, if, if you're lost, well, then we have procedures to go through. But anyway, these two, which was the Lancaster and the Spitfire, got temporarily unaware of their position somewhere between Larne, the taken off from Autogo, somewhere between Larne and the Mulla Galloway, Blackhead Light. And the call came through to ask, could you see them? I went down and looked at the radar and tweaked and we could see them. And they're only about 1,500 feet. So they were put over to us and um, I said to the, Sp the Spitfire was doing the RT because one aircraft are in formation, one aircraft does the one aircraft does the RT and you treat it as one aeroplane. Six in formation, one does the RT and they act as one aeroplane. It's when they can't see each other with the problem. It's when the problem uh, happens or arises. But anyway, the Spitfire could see the Lancaster and asked, could he take a turn? Now, usually you wouldn't turn an aircraft below a certain height because um, of mountains, et cetera, hills and all. And I think it's, uh, it's around about the city area. It's about 3,800 feet, 3,500 feet. Um, and he said he could take a turn as he was over the water. 
So normally you go through an identification procedure and all on the radar, but um, due to the position and what was happening, we couldn't, we couldn't actually do it. But I did see him turn and I asked him what he was heading. And then as he completed, as he came round through the turn, I asked him his heading again and says, oh, well, that's good enough. It's 30 degree. He's gone through 30 degrees, so that's uh, enough. So I was able to identify them, watch them at fairly low level. I think they went down to a thousand feet at one time. Give them a heading towards Larne. And um, he tells me he gets Larne in sight. And uh, that was it, back over to Autogram again. Well, that was one of, the, that's one of the ones that stuck in my mind, I think, you know. But I've um, got, got to thank you on the radio, but uh, nothing else afterwards. No, no bottles or anything afterwards, I think, you know. So <laughs> just one that sticks in the mind, you know. Is there, is there a minimum height above the ground that is used university set radar to work? Or does, it, or does it work in different areas down to different heights? Well, radar, radar as you're prob uh, well, you're probably aware, it's, it's like a big torch, okay? It's going round and round and round. So if you've got hills in the way, it reflects off the hills. It doesn't see through, it doesn't see through the hills. So coming up, uh, say you're coming up over the Isle of Man, it's perfectly clear because you're in the water. Are you, you're over the water, you're coming up that way. Coming up the east coast, you're coming up via Port of Vogie, uh, that direction and up towards Donaghadee. Because of the, I can only speak for operating at uh, the city, um, because of the Hollywood Hills, the radar can't see through the hills. So you're coming up over, coming up towards Donaghadee, you didn't drop them below 3,500 feet. Because if you dropped them below that level, they disappeared. And they didn't appear right till you were at Bangor again. So, or Bangor, just north of Bangor. So technically, if you were to lose them like that, you sort of lose control of them. Now, I'm saying that, that's the primary radar. The secondary radar, which is based on the um, transponder, will probably work okay. So you will, you will see that you still see a secondary trace, but you'll lose the primary trace. But eventually it does pop out again. So there are heights, yes. There are heights which um, you do not provide a radar service below uh, because of terrain, because of terrain and uh, other reflections of other stuff. So there are the height in different areas relies on basically what's in front of you. Yes, yeah, there are. As I say, there are there are areas that um, you don't you don't drop below. Coming up over the Newcastle area because of sleeve creep, and you'll forgive me, but I can't remember the exact height of it. But you didn't drop below uh, thirty, as far as I can remember, thirty-eight hundred feet there, because um, you have to have a thousand feet over terrain as well. So you have to take that into consideration. You don't cross the mountains uh, at um, specific heights, say a thousand feet, which is the normal. Um, you could actually set if the aircraft was in in descending or descending. You could actually set off the GPWS, the ground proximity warning system, on the aircraft. And uh, it'll tell them to climb. Um, it'll give them a warning, terrain, terrain, and it'll probably tell them to climb. Um, and then it's masses of paperwork. And um, the, 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 the theory is you keep yourself right. And that's basically it. Alistair, um, sorry, Alistair, uh, we're going to stop the recording here. Um, and uh, thanks for doing that wee talk there anyway. Um, but he'll give us a wee sec.